Welcome to this one hour English class to help you boost your fluency. In this lesson, we're going to focus on all areas of your English. I know you'll love it. Welcome back to J4's English. Of course, I'm Jennifer. Now let's get started. First, let's focus on your listening skills. And you're going to study fast English so you can improve your listening skills and add advanced expressions to your speech. Let's do that now. Here's how this lesson will work. I'm going to say a sentence three times and you need to write down exactly what you hear in the comments. After, I'll explain what I said and I'll explain the pronunciation changes that take place in fast English and I'll explain the advanced vocabulary that I used. Are you ready to get started? Remember, I'll say each sentence three times. That's out of our budget. That's out of our budget. That's out of our budget. Did you get this one? I said, that's out of our budget. Let's talk about the pronunciation changes. Notice that's. This is a contraction of that is, that's. Now we have out of. We can combine these two sounds together and it will sound like outa, outa. That's outa our budget, our, our. Notice the word is our because it's a possessive, our budget, the budget belongs to us, but I pronounce it just as a very unstressed R, R, our budget, our budget. But based on the context, it's obvious that it's not the verb to be, R, and it is in fact our, the possessive. That's out of our budget. Do you know what this means? The expression to be, the verb to be, that is, to be out of one's budget. So we need a possessive here, one's budget. That's another way of simply saying that something is too expensive. The cost exceeds what you're either willing to pay or what you're able to pay. Now, of course, you have a budget for your household and you can often use the expression, oh, sorry, that's out of our budget to say that you're not willing or able to pay for that item. But there's a budget in the workplace, for example, as well. So let's say you wanted a standing desk. So a standing desk is a desk that you're able to raise so you can work at it standing up because it's more comfortable and it's better for you. So you ask your boss, can you buy me a standing desk? But your boss says no. And he might say, oh, sorry, that's out of our budget. So this doesn't necessarily mean the company doesn't have the money to buy you a standing desk, but they're unwilling to buy you a standing desk. They don't want to spend the money. So remember, it can be unable because you don't have the money or unwilling. You have the money, but you don't want to spend it on that specific item. Sorry, that's out of our budget. I found one for sale, but it's out of my budget. Do you see a budget? I don't see a budget. Let's try this again with another listening exercise. I'll say it three times. Money's no object. Money's no object. Money's no object. This one was easy, right? I said money is no object. Notice at the beginning here, money's. Money is, this is a contraction, money's. Money's no object. Now it's important that you hear these contractions because they're necessary for grammar because the expression is to be no object. Money is no object. If you don't hear that contraction, then the sentence won't make sense grammatically. This is an expression that means the opposite of what we just learned. If you say money is no object, it means that the cost of something is not a concern or a limitation. So basically you're saying I'm willing to pay any price for this specific 
item. It's common to use this in specific situations. Maybe it's your husband or your wife, your best friend, your mother's birthday, and it's a very special birthday. So on this specific occasion for planning that special someone's birthday, money's no object. So you might say, can you recommend somewhere special for my husband's birthday? Now, when someone recommends something, of course, they're going to think about the price. So you can tell the person and money is no object. So they know that they can recommend the most expensive restaurant and you're comfortable with that in this specific situation. Or maybe in our last example, you asked your boss to buy you a standing desk and he said, okay, sure will buy you a standing desk. So you can go into the store and you can say, my boss is paying for this desk, so money's no object. Money's no object, as you probably know. Sure, money's no object. Okay. I told you, money's no object. Let's try this again with another listening exercise. I'll say it three times. I'm beyond livid. I'm beyond livid. I'm beyond livid. I said, I'm beyond livid. For pronunciation, just notice that contraction. I am, I'm, I'm beyond livid. What does livid mean? Well, it's an adjective that means extremely angry. I'm livid. Now, when we add beyond, this is an intensifier. So extremely angry, livid is already very intense, but if you add beyond livid, it makes it 10 times stronger. I'm extremely, extremely angry. I'm beyond livid. Just remember to conjugate that verb to be. So if you're speaking about a past emotion, you could say, I was beyond livid when my boss denied my desk reimbursement. So here, a desk reimbursement is when you pay for something, and if you're reimbursed, it means someone gives you that money after, usually your company. But in this case, your boss denied your desk reimbursement, even though in the last example, you bought the most expensive desk because remember, money was no object, but now you have to pay for that very expensive desk. So that's why you were beyond livid. You can use beyond to intensify any emotion, any adjective. She was beyond happy when she passed her IELTS. I'm beyond awful. I'm beyond scared. That is beyond exciting. Let's try this one more time. I'll say it three times. Her comment's been gnawing at me. Her comment's been gnawing at me. Her comment's been gnawing at me. I said her comment has been gnawing at me me. In spoken English, it's very common to take that auxiliary verb has and form a contraction with the subject. This is more informal, but it happens most of the time by native speakers in spoken English. Her comments been, her comments been gnawing at me. So you have to hear that auxiliary verb in the contraction, but the sentence structure tells you that the contraction is there because grammatically it's required. Now in written English, it would be more common and proper to say her comment has been gnawing at me. But even if I were to see that in written form, if I were to read it out loud, I would just automatically form that contraction in spoken English. Notice that pronunciation for gnawing, that G is silent. Gnawing, gnawing. Her comments been gnawing at me. What does this mean? The expression is to gnaw at someone. When something gnaws at someone, it means that something really irritates or bothers 
that person. That something really preoccupies your thoughts, which means you keep thinking about it, you can't get it out of your head. So maybe you were telling your coworker how you bought the most expensive desk because money was no object, or so you thought, but then your boss denied your desk reimbursement and you were beyond livid. You were telling this whole story to your co coworker and instead of sympathy, your coworker said, I told you not to buy the most expensive desk. And that comment, what your coworker said, has been gnawing at you which means you keep thinking about it. It keeps bothering you and irritating you. You can't get it out of your mind, even though it happened hours ago, days ago, or weeks ago, it's been gnawing at you. Something was still gnawing at me. Now oh, it's secretly gnawing away at you. No, no, why, why didn't he? Now let's do an imitation exercise so you can practice your pronunciation and imitate how a native speaker would say each sentence. I'll say each sentence again three times and I want you to repeat that sentence out loud to practice your pronunciation. That's out of our budget. That's out of our budget. That's out of our budget. Money's no object. Money's no object. Money's no object. I'm beyond livid. I'm beyond livid. I'm beyond livid. Her comments been gnawing at me. Her comments been gnawing at me. Her comments been gnawing at me. Amazing job. Now let's keep going and let's review a news article together. In this article, you're going to learn a lot of advanced expressions, improve your vocabulary, improve your grammar, and even your pronunciation. So let's review the article now. First, I'll read the headline. Japanese firm unveils a vertical pod that lets you nap upright. So in this picture here, you can see the vertical pod. So pod is the name for this unit. And then vertical is the fact that it's upright. So vertical and then horizontal is across. So it's not a horizontal pod, like your bed is horizontal. This is a vertical pod and it lets you nap upright. So just like I said, horizontal, you would be sleeping in your bed. You would not be upright. You would be lying down. So in this case, for napping, for sleeping, the opposite of upright would be lying down because that's how we normally sleep. Except if you're in Japan using one of these vertical pods, you'll be napping upright just like this woman in the photo. So what do you think? Before we even read this article, do you think you could nap in this pod upright? Share your thoughts, yes or no, put that in the comments. Certainly an interesting concept. I wrote that information for you and I also wrote the definition of nap. I think it should be well known, but a nap is of course a short sleep, usually during the day. Now in this Example, nap is a verb, which of course you can do to nap, just like to sleep. So I could ask you, oh, do you nap? Do you nap? I'm asking you, do you sleep for a short period of time during the day? Do you nap? Now, it's very common to use nap as a noun. If you use nap as a noun, you have two choices of verbs and it does not matter which one you use. Both are very common and natural. Do you take naps? Do you have naps? So you can use either one equally. So what about you? Do you nap? Do you take naps? Do you have naps? Share that in the comments as well. Now maybe you'll start taking more naps if you had this vertical pod. 
Now, don't worry about writing all these notes because I summarize everything in a free lesson PDF, so you can look for the link in the description. Before we continue with the article, I also wrote the definition for unveil. This is a verb, to unveil. When you unveil something, you show it for the first time or you introduce it for the first time. So when this vertical pod was unveiled, it means the public, you and I, were able to see it for the first time. So the Japanese firm, firm is another word for company. Japanese firm, Japanese company, unveils a vertical pod that lets you nap upright. All right, let's find out more about this. It's interesting that it's also in a public place. I don't know if I could nap in a public place with people just walking around. Interesting concept though, let's find out. Experts have long argued that having a power nap at work. Okay, let's look at this because you could say experts have argued that having a power nap at work and then whatever it is, we'll get to that in a second. But notice how they added have long argued. This is another way of saying experts have argued for a long time. So instead of saying for a long time, experts have argued for a long time, you can simply take the word long and use it before the verb. Experts have long argued. So maybe you could say, I have long said that improving your English is important for your career. So I've said for a long time. So I haven't just said this once or twice. I've long said. Experts have long argued that having a power nap. Let's take a look at power nap. A power nap is a nap, but when I hear a power nap, I picture a nap that is for a short period of time. So you're really this just there to have a very short nap for the sole purpose of waking up and being able to perform better. Whereas you could have a nap on a Sunday afternoon just for the purpose of relaxing and pure enjoyment. But a power nap, you just want to have a very short nap so you can wake up and be more energized, more productive, work better, work smarter. Have you ever had a power nap? Do you think the idea of power naps is a good idea or a bad idea? Share that in the comments as well. Okay, have long argued that having a power nap can at work, so not on a Sunday afternoon at home on the couch, at work can increase alertness. Alertness, this is your adjective, an adjective to just say that you are very awake. Your alertness is you're very, you're very awake. So you should never drive if you're not alert, because if you're not very awake, that can be very dangerous. So your, your amount of mentally being very awake. Alertness, boost productivity. Boost is a very common way of saying increase, increase. We use this a lot especially in a business context. For example, we need to boost our sales. We need to increase our sales. I wrote that example here for you. Now, of course, boost is a verb, so you have to conjugate it. In this example, that nap, this should say nap, not help, that nap really boosted my alertness. Okay, so here, Boost is in the past simple because it's a completed past action. That nap really boosted my alertness. Now, previously, I think I said alertness is an adjective. If I said that it is not, that's incorrect. <laughs> alertness is the noun form, is speaking about alert, being alert, Alert is the adjective and alertness is the noun form. So it's just speaking about it as a thing, as a concept. So my alertness, because we often have articles or possessives before nouns. So alertness 
is a noun. I put it here for you. And alert is an adjective. I'm sorry if previously I said the wrong thing. Now, again, your alertness is your feeling of being awake. And we often talk about it with mentally awake. So you could also say that nap helped me become more alert. So in this case, alert is our adjective. I am alert. I feel alert. I've become more alert. That nap helped me become more alert. So this is what the article or the company who created this vertical pod for upright napping is suggesting as the importance of having naps. Let's continue. Boost productivity and even make you more creative. Are you enjoying this lesson? If you are, then I want to tell you about the Finally Fluent Academy. This is my premium training program where we study native English speakers from TV, the movies, YouTube, and the news so you can improve your listening skills of fast English, expand your vocabulary with natural expressions, and learn advanced grammar easily. Plus, you'll have me as your personal coach. You can look in the description for the link to learn more, or you can go to my website and click on Finally Fluent Academy. Now let's continue with our lesson. Now, a Japanese firm, remember firm company, has revealed. Before, do you remember the verb that they used in the headline? It was unveiled, unveiled. When you reveal something, you also introduce it or make it known, show it for the first time. So in this context, is exactly the same. Has unveiled, has revealed. Now they've revealed a bizarre pod. By using the adjective bizarre, they're saying it's strange, strange, bizarre, unusual. And it is, right? The fact that it's an upright and you nap upright instead of lying down, so you're in a vertical position rather than a horizontal position, that is bizarre. Most people don't sleep like that. At least in North America, we don't. If you're in Japan, you can let us know, is this a common practice in Japan? Have you ever seen this pod in Japan? So if you're watching from Japan or you've been to Japan, please share your thoughts on this as well. So that's what they mean by bizarre as an adjective. So we can say strange or unusual, strange, unusual. Bizarre pod that makes it easier than ever before for workers to grab some shut eye. So to grab some shut eye, well, right now I'm closing my eyes, but you can also say I'm shutting my eyes is not very common to say shut your eyes, but you can say that it's more common to say, close your eyes, close your eyes. But this is where the expression shut eye comes from, shut eye. So if you want to grab some shut eye is another way of saying grab some sleep, sleep, okay? And remember, a nap is just a short sleep, usually during the day. And American English speakers, we commonly replace the verb get with grab. It's very common for us to do this. It's more informal, it's more casual, but it's very frequently done. It would be very common for an American to text a friend or call a friend or just say to a friend, a coworker, anyone, hey, do you wanna grab a coffee? Do you wanna grab a coffee after work? Extremely common, I use it all the time myself. And it's just a replacement to, do you wanna get a coffee? Which I guess is also a replacement to, do you want to have a coffee after work? But very common to use grab. You don't have to use it if you're not comfortable with it because it does depend on the specific context if it's appropriate or not. But it is important that you understand 
what it means in the context, even if you choose not to use it, you don't want to use it yourself, that's fine. You can just use get or have. But again, important to understand this is how native speakers speak in the real world. So for it makes it easier than ever before for workers to grab some shut eye, get some sleep. Giraffe nap. So this is the name of the pod, giraffe nap. Giraffe nap is a vertical pod that lets office employees sleep upright, upright. So again, very interesting. Of course, they're not targeting this for your home because why would you get this in your home? You have your couch, you have your bed. That's where you would have a nap, right? But this is for the office. So they're targeting office employees. So it lets office employees sleep upright, much like the long necked mammal. The long necked mammal, of course, they're talking about a giraffe. And that's where the name came from because a giraffe sleeps upright. Many animals sleep upright, not really a trait of humans, but many animals sleep upright. About the size as a small public phone booth, it contains a series of platforms. So notice here the sentence structure, because we're not starting with a subject. This is just additional information about the pod, but the sentence really starts here because this is our subject, it. Otherwise, you would say, it is about the size as a small public phone booth, period. It contains, and then you can continue on, it contains a series of platforms. This would be a separate sentence. This alone cannot be a separate sentence because there is no subject. But you can turn it into a separate sentence by having your subject. And then if you have a subject, you of course need a verb. And then the rest of the sentence, which describes the subject. It is about the size as a small public phone booth. It contains. But here, this is just additional information about the size. So this is a more casual way of saying approximately about. I slept for about 20 minutes, approximately 20 minutes. You could also say around 20 minutes. All three of those are very commonly used. Approximately is the most formal and then around about are more casual ways of saying it. It contains a series of platforms that support body weight while blocking out noise from the outside. Okay, if you block something out, you're blocking out noise. It means you're preventing it from, from entering. We specifically use the phrasal verb to block out with light and noise. So in this case, it's noise. So if you're in this public place, you don't have to worry about wearing earplugs because the pod itself is soundproof. It blocks out the noise. But I wonder if it blocks out the light because the room is very light and when you're napping, it's probably easier if it's dark. But it looks like it does have a cover and maybe when you close the cover, it becomes completely dark as well. So it could also block out the light. Otherwise, you might want to wear an eye mask to block out the light. And I wrote that example here. This eye mask really blocks out the light. Let's continue. However, at just 8.4 feet high and four feet wide, claustrophobes might want to opt for the office sofa. Okay, claustrophobes. The more common expression is claustrophobics. Listen to the pronunciation, claustrophobic, claustrophobic. And then you add an S to it to mean all claustrophobic people, claustrophobics, claustrophobics. People who are claustrophobic, and then if you just say claustrophobics, 
it means people who are claustrophobic. So claustrophobics don't like small spaces. It makes them very uncomfortable. So maybe even being in an elevator would be uncomfortable because it's a small enclosed space. And of course, our vertical pod is a small enclosed space, especially if you put the cover over it to block out the light, it would feel even more enclosed. So if you're claustrophobic, you wouldn't like this. Claustrophobes, claustrophobics wouldn't like this. Claustrophobes might want to opt for the office sofa. If you opt for something, it means you choose that as an option. So let's say you're going mattress shopping and there are so many different types of mattresses to choose from. You could say we opted for a firm mattress to mean that you chose a firm mattress and there were many, many other options. Now to use this expression, there could just be two options, firm and soft, and you opted for the firm mattress. You, we use the preposition for if it's followed by a noun. If it's a verb, then you just use the infinitive. We opted to buy a firm mattress. And opt is a verb, so you need to conjugate it, and that's why it's in the past simple with the ed. We opted to buy a firm mattress, which is just another way of saying we chose to buy a firm mattress. So claustrophobes might want to opt for the office sofa. So they have the vertical pod, which might make them feel claustrophobic or they have the office sofa. So if they opt for it, they choose the office sofa and they don't choose the vertical pod. What about you? Which one would you opt for? Would you opt for the pod or the sofa? I think I would personally give the pod a try. I'm not claustrophobic, so that wouldn't bother me at all. And it looks interesting. I would definitely like to try a power nap in the pod the giraffe pod. Okay, let's continue. The firm said it's working towards a society where everyone can easily take a nap. So remember here we have our verb take a nap, but you can also use which verb? Have. You can also use have a nap, or you could also just say where everyone can easily nap. And you can just use nap as a verb. So instead of take a nap, have a nap, you can just say easily nap. So I'll put this one under here. Can easily nap, can easily have a nap, can easily take a nap. And ultimately improve business and healthcare. So the company believes in naps. They they think that they're very beneficial, so they want everyone in society to regularly have naps. Do you think that would be a good idea? Feel free to share. There are probably many people who have been unable to get rid of their physical fatigue. Fatigue is another way of saying tiredness, sleepiness, that feeling of being tired, but fatigue, it sounds stronger. It affects your whole health, fatigue. So I wrote extreme tiredness for fatigue and to get rid of, this is another way of saying to eliminate, to permanently remove, to get rid of, to get rid of their physical fatigue and stress and have endured sleepiness and continued to work, the firm says. The verb endure simply means to experience, but we only use it for difficult negative things. So I wouldn't say, oh, I endured a beautiful day at the park. It, because a beautiful day at the park is not a difficult thing. I endured a night of terrible sleep. So I experienced it, but I experienced it in a very negative way. I endured a night of difficult restless sleep. So now I'm fatigued. I'm extremely tired. So have endured sleepiness and continue to work, the firm says. Now we are approaching an era where we're breaking down such stereotypes. 
So if you break down a stereotype, it means you try to eliminate it. So you could use the get rid of. We're trying to get rid of, eliminate such stereotypes. Eliminate, and I'll write down, get rid of. And the stereotype, although they don't specifically say it here, I guess the stereotype would be that it's normal to be fatigued and continue to work. So it's normal to, to just go through your eight hours, even though you're very tired, rather than have a nap, a power nap, and try to boost your alertness, your productivity, your creativity. I think that's the stereotype. Because I don't know about in your country or your part of the world, but in North America, I would say naps aren't really something that most adults do. And I guess it's probably viewed more as, as like, why do you need a nap? You shouldn't take a nap. You should just work through it. You need to work through the day. That's more the attitude. I would say in North America, naps are generally for children and the elderly, but not really adults and certainly not in the middle of the day at work. It, it's, it's not a common practice. It's certainly not viewed as a positive thing. So that's probably the stereotype. What about in, in your country, in your part of the world is, are naps viewed more positively as being productive? Is it appropriate for an adult to have a nap in the middle of the day at work? So share that because I would be really interested to know because in North America, I would say currently I, it, it isn't a common practice. It wouldn't be viewed very positively. And I think that's the stereotype they're trying to break down, eliminate, get rid of. Let's continue. The company recommends a nap time of 20 minutes. So a nap time of 20 minutes, that's the total length of the nap. I'm laughing a little because when you say, oh, it's nap time, this is what we say to children. And remember I said, oh, in North America, it's not common for adults to have a nap. I have only ever heard of nap time in the context of a child. Oh, it's nap time. Oh, it's my kid's nap time. Sorry, I can't, I can't grab a coffee. It's my kid's nap time. But in this context, that's not how they're using it. They're just saying a nap duration of 20 minutes. It's just funny seeing nap time because as I said, that's what parents use with their children. So a nap duration of 20 minutes as anything longer than 30 minutes can affect your sleep at night. So again, that's the concept of a power nap, a power nap. There's really that emphasis on the nap not being very long and the sole purpose of it is so you can wake up more alert, more productive, more creative, not because you want to have this relaxing, enjoyable, lazy sleep on the couch on a Sunday afternoon. That's not the purpose. So a power nap. And that's the end of our article. So I'm interested to hear your thoughts about naps and how your culture, your society, your country views naps in general, because I shared at least how it's viewed in North America. And now what I'll do is I'll read the article from start to finish, and this time you can focus on my pronunciation. Japanese firm unveils a vertical pod that lets you nap upright. Experts have long argued that having a power nap at work can increase alertness, boost productivity, and even make you more creative. Now, a Japanese firm has revealed a bizarre pod that makes it easier than ever before for workers to grab some shut-eye. Giraffe nap is a vertical pod that lets office employees sleep upright, much like the long neck mammal. About the size as a small public phone booth, it contains a series of platforms that support body weight while blocking out noise from the outside. 
However, at just 8.4 feet high and 4 feet wide, claustrophobes might want to opt for the office sofa. The firm said it is working towards a society where everyone can easily take a nap and ultimately improve business and healthcare. There are probably many people who have been unable to get rid of their physical fatigue and stress and have endured sleepiness and continue to work, the firm says. Now we are approaching an era where we're breaking down such stereotypes. The company recommends a nap time of 20 minutes as anything longer than 30 minutes can affect your sleep at night. You're doing amazing. Let's keep going. And now let's focus on phrasal verbs because they're such an important part of a native speaker's vocabulary. So now we'll learn some very common phrasal verbs. Now, first in the lesson, I'm going to quiz you to see how well you know these phrasal verbs. And then after the quiz, I'll explain each phrasal verb in detail. And then you'll do the quiz again so you can see how much you've improved in just this short period of time. So let's start your quiz now. Question one, I really appreciate how much time you spend. The annual report. Now I'm only going to give you three seconds to answer, which isn't very much time. So feel free to hit pause, take as much time as you need. And when you're ready to see the answer, hit play. Grinding away at. Question two. I know the fire alarm was scary, but you need to pull yourself together. Question three. My coworker is so annoying. He always Justin Bieber songs in the office. Belts out. Question four. I couldn't think of the word for bridge in my presentation. So I acted it out. Question five. We need to be honest with the team. We shouldn't the auditor's recommendations. Talk down. Question six. The fact that my husband forgot my birthday has been all week. Gnawing at me. Question seven. The team Numerous penalties during the competition. Racked up. Question eight. I think the comedian's humor. I've been telling jokes since the show. Rubbed off on me. Question nine. No need to apologize. Everyone from time to time. Slips up. And finally, question 10. I'll be in your city next week for a conference. I hope you have time to to catch up. So how'd you do with the quiz? Now, don't worry if it was difficult. Don't worry if you got zero questions right, because now I'm going to explain each phrasal verb in detail. And I promise after the next quiz, you'll do a lot better. So let's review each phrasal verb now. Number one, to act out. This is when you perform or explain something using actions and gestures. For example, right now I'm acting out, it's raining, using my actions and my gestures. I'm teaching you this one because when you don't speak a language fluently, often we act out what we mean to help the other person understand. For example, I couldn't think of the word for sunrise, so I acted it out. How you're going to act out sunrise? I'm not sure. You can try though. Another example, I'm not sure what you mean. Could you try acting it out? This could be a smart way for you to understand what someone else is saying. Number two, to belt out. 
I love this one because it means to sing loudly. For example, the crowd belted out the national anthem before the game. So the crowd sang the national anthem loudly. They belted it out. And here's another example that is true for me. I love driving alone because I can belt out my favorite songs. I can sing those songs very loudly. Number three, to catch up with someone. This is a must know phrasal verb. This is when you meet someone after a period of time to find out what they've been doing. So let's say you and your friend haven't seen each other for one month. Well, you don't know what your friend has been doing for that one month. So you could text your friend and say, we need to catch up. Are you free tomorrow? This is a very common way that two native speakers will arrange a social gathering. You could also simply say, let's catch up soon. And this means let's meet soon so I can find out what you've been doing and you can find out what I've been doing since the last time we saw each other. Number four, to grind away at something. This is when you work on something for a long time or with a lot of effort. For example, I had to grind away at my taxes all weekend. So this means I worked on my taxes, but because I said grind away at, you know it took me a long time and a lot of effort. You could also say, I've been grinding away at this report all week, but it's still not done. So you've spent a lot of time on this report, you've put in a lot of effort, but it's still not done. You've been grinding away at it. Number five, to gnaw at. This means to trouble, worry, or annoy someone. First of all, notice that silent G, gnaw. Gnaw. It starts with a n, an n sound. Gnaw at. To gnaw at. For example, his text message has been gnawing at me all day. So his text message has been troubling me, worrying me, or annoying me. You don't exactly know which one it is, but based on context and based on my emotion, my facial emotion, you would know. His text message has been gnawing at me all day. Or let's say you were in a meeting and your coworker said something negative about you in front of everyone and it's been bothering you. Well, your friend could say, don't let his comment gnaw at you. Don't let his comment bother you or annoy you. Number six, to pull oneself together. This means to become calm or to regain control of your emotions. Calm down, calm down, calm down. So let's say your coworker made that angry or rude or mean comment towards you in front of everyone else and you became very emotional. You became very upset or very ag agitated or very angry even. Your friend could say, pull yourself together to let you know you need to regain control of your emotions because you're being too upset, too angry. We also commonly use this in the imperative, pull yourself together. So notice with the imperative, you start with the base verb. Pull yourself together, you need to pull yourself together. Both of those are very common. And then an hour later, your friend could say, hey, I was calling you, where were you? And you could say, oh, I went for a walk alone to pull myself together, to regain control of my emotions and simply to become calm. Number seven, to rack up. This means to acquire a lot of something and that something is generally negative. For example, I racked up a lot of parking tickets while I was on vacation. 
So maybe you're in a new city and you're not familiar with the parking rules and regulations. So you racked up a lot of parking tickets. Parking tickets are of course negative. Or you could say, when I was a student, I racked up a lot of student debt. Again, student debt is of course a negative and you racked it up, you acquired it. Number eight, to rub off on. This is when a quality or a characteristic is passed from one person to another person. For example, her passion and enthusiasm rubbed off on me. So this means my friend was being very passionate and enthusiastic. And because of that, I became very passionate and enthusiastic. So her passion and enthusiasm rubbed off on me. But we also use this with negative qualities and characteristics. For example, don't let Frank's anxiety rub off on you. So Frank is always anxious and he's sharing his anxieties in public with his team. If you are not careful, his anxieties could rub off on you, which means you will become anxious simply because Frank is anxious and you're in the same room as Frank. Number nine, to slip up. This means to make a careless error or mistake. For example, I can't believe I slipped up and told her about her surprise party. So there was a surprise party being planned for this person and because it's a surprise, you're not supposed to let the person know. But I slipped up and I told her about the party. I made a mistake and it was a careless mistake. I should have known better. Another example, you purchased 1,000 units instead of 100 units. That was a real slip up. What do you notice here? A slip up. Here, it's being used as the noun form to simply mean a mistake, a careless mistake. And finally, number 10, to talk down. This is when you try to make something sound less important, less important than it really is in reality. For example, the CEO tried to talk down the recent layoffs. Layoffs is when you fire people from a company because there is no longer work for them. So that sounds like the company could be in trouble. But if you try to talk down the recent layoffs, it means you try to make them sound less severe, less important than they really are. Or remember when I accidentally ordered 1,000 units instead of 100 units? Well, I could say, I tried to talk down my slip up. Remember here, slip up is being used as the noun form of the phrasal verb to slip up and it means a careless mistake. I try to talk down my slip up, my careless mistake. So I try to make my mistake, the fact I ordered 10 times as many units as needed, I try to make that sound like not a big deal, not a big mistake. I try to talk down my slip up. Now that you're more comfortable with these phrasal verbs, let's do that same quiz again so you can see how much you've improved since the beginning of this lesson. Here are the questions. Hit pause, take as much time as you need, and when you're ready, hit play to see the answers. Here are the answers. Hit pause and take as much time as you need to review them. Amazing job. Now share your scores from those quizzes in the comments from the first quiz and the second quiz so everyone can see how much you've improved and that will inspire and motivate them.
Now you're not done yet because we have one more section in this masterclass and we're going to focus on medical vocabulary and you're going to learn over 50 very commonly used medical expressions because students ask me to teach them medical expressions they can use in their daily lives. So that's what we'll do now. Let's talk about a patient. A patient is a person receiving medical care. We will all be patients at some point in our life, and I'm sure all of us have already been patients on numerous occasions. Now, right now, I'm not a patient, even though I have a doctor, I'm not a patient because currently I'm not receiving medical care. This only applies when you're in the process of receiving medical care. There are two types of patients. You can be an inpatient, which means you're admitted to the hospital to receive care. If you're an inpatient, you're going to be at the hospital for a night, a week, or even longer. You have a hospital room and a hospital bed. Many inpatients are in an area of the hospital called the ICU. This stands for the Intensive Care Unit, the ICU. And this is where inpatients go to receive a high level of care. You can also be an outpatient, which most of us usually are, which means you receive care without being admitted to the hospital. You are an outpatient when you go to the ER, which is the emergency room. You're there to receive care for a specific treatment or illness. They treat you and then you leave. You don't stay overnight at the hospital. Now let's talk about common medical professionals you need to know. Of course, you already know doctor, also known as a physician. In North America, it's more common to simply say doctor, but it means the same thing. Most of us have a GP, which stands for a general practitioner. This is a doctor who treats a wide range of issues. So you can go to your GP because you have a pain in your back or because you have a cold or a throat infection or an eye issue, a wide range of issues, you can go to your GP. A surgeon is of course a doctor who performs surgery. There are also many specialists and this is a doctor who focuses on one specific medical area, a cardiologist focuses on your heart. A dermatologist focuses on your skin. A pediatrician focuses on children. And in North America, whenever you go to a pediatrician, at the end, they always give you a sucker because kids are always scared of going to the pediatrician, which is a doctor for children. So they treat you with a sucker or a small treat after. An optometrist, focuses on your eyes. If you wear glasses, you frequently go to your optometrist. A dentist, of course, focuses on oral health and your teeth. An OBGYN. I have no idea what this stands for. I know it's a very long word, but everyone just says OBGYN. An OBGYN is a doctor specifically for women when you're pregnant or to discuss reproductive issues. An anesthesiologist. Don't let the spelling confuse you. Native speakers have difficult with the pronunciation of this. Anesthesiologist. Anesthesiologist. An anesthesiologist administers anesthesia, which is what makes you go unconscious before surgery. They also monitor you during surgery. A radiologist does the x-rays, CT scans, and MRIs. A psychiatrist focuses on your mind and mental disorders. Fun fact, both of my neighbors are doctors. One is a GP and the other is a psychiatrist. So if I need any help, both physically and mentally, I'm covered. And an ENT 
stands for ear, nose, and throat. So that doctor, an ENT, focuses on those three things, ear, nose, and throat. There are more specialists, but these are the most common. Of course, nurses are just as important as doctors. You can be a registered nurse, an RN. This means you have a nursing degree and you have a license in the specific area where you are a nurse. You can also be a nurse practitioner, an NP, which means you have more advanced training and you can diagnose and treat specific medical conditions. Let's talk about a routine checkup. This is something that all of us do, hopefully every six months or one year. And this is when you see your GP, your general practitioner, just to review your overall health. So you don't have a specific medical issue, it's just a routine appointment. We call that a checkup, a routine checkup. During that routine checkup, your GP, general practitioner, is going to examine your vital signs. Your vital signs include your temperature, your heart rate, and your blood pressure. Now you can also discuss any specific medical issues that you're having with your GP during the routine checkup. Of course, you can schedule an appointment at a separate time for a specific medical issue. If you are discussing a specific medical concern or issue with your GP, it's possible that they'll refer you to a specialist. For example, your GP could say, I'm going to refer you to an ENT. Remember, that's ear, nose, and throat. That's what the doctor specializes in. When you see the specialist, or even when you're with your GP, you're going to talk about your symptoms. A symptom is any feeling of illness that you're currently having or that you've had in the past that you want to discuss with your GP or the specialist. And when you're talking to the doctor, one of the very first things they'll say is, what are your symptoms? What are your symptoms? And then you simply tell the doctor what's wrong, what you're feeling that isn't right. For example, I have a lot of back pain, my left arm is sore, my feet are numb, which means you can't feel your feet. If they're numb, you can't feel them. My vision is blurry, which means you can't see very well. Or you could say, I feel nauseous. Nauseous, that's the feeling you get when you're on a roller coaster. I feel nauseous. Those are just some symptoms you may be experiencing. You can experience or have a symptom. There are, of course, many, many other symptoms that you could have and that you would discuss with your GP or specialist. After listening to your symptoms, the doctor might want to do some diagnostic tests. These are tests or an exam to determine the existence or the absence of a specific medical condition, disease, or illness. Common examples of diagnostic tests are an MRI, an x-ray, or a CT scan. After these diagnostic tests, the doctor will have a diagnosis, which is a judgment about what the illness or medical problem is. Then you can discuss the treatment options. These are the different courses of action that you can take to address the medical issue or the different treatments available. If the treatment option includes medication, well then the doctor will write you a prescription. A prescription is a written order, or in our modern world, most likely an electronic order, for a specific medical treatment like a drug or a specific pill. You can take your prescription to a pharmacy because at the pharmacy, of course, there'll be a pharmacist and a pharmacist fills the prescription, which just means they provide you with 
the medical treatment. On the prescription, it will tell you what the dosage is, and this is information the pharmacist needs. The dosage is the amount or quantity of the medical treatment like a specific drug. So how much of that drug are you getting and what is the quantity of the active drug in each pill that you get? That's the dosage. The pharmacist will also talk about any side effects. So the side effects of a specific medical treatment, those are the unintended consequences. So if you take a pill, it might cause headaches but it's trying to treat your sore arm, but then it causes a headache. So that's the side effect of the pill. Any unintended consequences or adverse reactions, those are the side effects. And then later you can schedule a follow-up appointment with your GP or specialist to discuss if your symptoms have been relieved at all, if the course of action, the treatment is working, if there needs to be any changes to the dosage, a different prescription, you can discuss all of that with your GP or specialist at a follow-up appointment. Congratulations on completing the one hour masterclass. You did such an amazing job. Now, if you enjoyed this class and you want me to make more lessons just like this, then put one hour, put one hour in the comments, one hour in the comments, and I'll keep making these masterclasses for you. And of course, make sure you like this video, share it with your friends, and subscribe so you're notified every time I post a new lesson. And you can get this free speaking guide where I share six tips on how to speak English fluently and confidently. You can click here to download it or look in the description for the link. And you can keep improving your English with this lesson right now.